Welcome back to the Attract Online conference. For those of you who are joining just now, um, I'm just going to share a word about Attract. So Attract is a European-funded project, which is all about creating a breakthrough ecosystem in the field of imaging and detection technologies. But it's also more than this, and you will see shortly um, with the first session that we have for this afternoon. So from the very early stage of Attract, the idea was always to integrate the young generation. Why? Because when you, when you talk about deep tech, the idea is really that the young generation will be the one using it and even the one creating it. So that's why, as part of the Attract project, it was a program uh, designed and run in the last 12 months, uh, which is called the Young Innovator and Entrepreneurs Pilot Program. We have some of the students that have been through this program with us today, and they will showcase what they did and also tell us what they learned. They're going to join us in a panel discussion. And to moderate this session, I have the pleasure to welcome Sumati Subramanyam. Uh, Sumati is a policy officer in the unit of higher education in DGAC in the European Commission. I just remind also uh, the, the audience that uh, we're going to take uh, some live questions. Uh, so please use the Slido window, which is next to the webcast or under, depending on where you're watching us from. And make sure that you share your question so that we can bring them back to the panel so that they can answer them. So to your creativity to share with us some of these questions that you have. So Sumati, uh, welcome to this uh, conference. Um, I'm going to let you introduce uh, the panels that you have along the way. And the floor will be yours after this video, which is presenting the Attract Student Pilot Project. I'm happy to be here today to moderate this session on a topic that's very close to my heart. How can we prepare the next generation for the deep tech revolution? We have an interesting program that will bring together students and representatives from higher education institutions and the business world. The discussion promises to be insightful. Participants, you're most welcome, as Romain said, to post your questions on Slido, which we will try to answer towards the end of the session. So without further ado, let's dive into it. First, I have the pleasure of introducing Sofia Katarina Jakobsen. Hello, Sophie. I'm Sophie, a student from Riga Technical University. And during the last year, I participated in the project development project running at the Alto Design Factory. Our team's task was to develop a new product using our sponsors, Heat Seeds Technology. During the course, we created Stylo, a device that could improve the stroke rehabilitation process. According to the World Stroke Organization, there are over 13.7 million new stroke cases each year. It is estimated that one in four people over the age of 25 will suffer a stroke in their lifetime. 
This condition can cause paralysis to a part of the victim's body, and the only way to regain movement is a long and painful process of repetitive exercises, which can be as simple as moving one finger at a time. We asked ourselves, how can we make this daunting process an enjoyable journey, bringing an element of fun while creating a stronger link between the physiotherapist and the patient? With this in mind, we created Stelo, a stroke therapy companion capable of tracking every rehabilitation exercise and transforming them into entertaining VR experiences. It was designed not only to make rehabilitation a more enjoyable process, but also to create a stronger connection between the patients and the physiotherapists, even at the comfort of one's home. So, how did we make this happen? Stello is a joint project between students at Alto University in Helsinki and the international team in Riga's Technical University as part of the product development project. With multidisciplinary expertise, the team was able to combine their different abilities and to surpass the challenges of the project. From an early stage, the team went through a long process of brainstorming, exploring ideas related to controlling machines remotely, e-textiles interventions, and the improvement of computer-aided design applications, which we got to thoroughly explore during our PD6 week. But the team was attracted by the idea of using VR technology as a tool to truly make a significant change in people's lives, which led us to research into the healthcare sector. Through a series of interviews, workshops, and supervised physiotherapy routines, we were able to create a clear picture of the user journey of the evolving interaction between physiotherapists and patients, identifying pain points and opportunities for improvements. Meanwhile, we started getting familiar with our sponsor's technology. Starting off with a schedule of typical rehabilitation exercises, we could measure and visualize the values outputted by the Hitzy Cheap using a Bluetooth dongle to communicate with a computer containing VR app and exercise assessment functions. Working with gyroscopes, the actual heat seed microchip and several lines of coding was a big challenge to the team. Each member contributed to the final outcome by stepping up, learning a great deal of information in a relatively short period of time. Meanwhile, we explored the physical product, closely studying the patient's requirements and movement limitations. We started off with lots of sketches, exploring shape and features, quickly implementing our ideas with 3D softwares and printing some of them for immediate testing. The final redesign features a much sleeker and smarter shape, tailored to work on all body types, and a modular feature with a simple but extremely effective magnetic mechanism, easy to operate with just one hand. A main concern was to design an interface which could be easily navigable by patients of all ages. To do so, the team designed a wireframe for the application which reduced the information display to the minimum. This required a long process of definition of the information architecture, which we tested with peers and through video calls with physiotherapists. While the journey of rehabilitation can be long and painful, full of ups and downs, we believe in a future in which Stelo will bring motivation and enjoyment into the everyday therapy, accompanying those hits by this condition along a faster and brighter recovery. Wow, thank you, Sophia. Stello is indeed the future of rehabilitation, a very good example of how deep technologies impact medical devices. Now, let's move on to a totally different field, climate, and see how Apurva, Danu, and his teammates got together to co-innovate Sky Echo. Apurva, I invite you to take the floor. Thanks for the introduction. So in our team, our large theme, our focus was on building the weather resilient cities of tomorrow. Yeah. 
So our team consisted of six master's students from Aalto University from three different domains. Rio and Fator were our designers, focusing on user experience and visual design, respectively. Yeah. Ero and Elmeri were both from electrical engineering, and Ling and I were the business students focusing on marketing and management. And together, we formed an ideal multidisciplinary team to focus on this project with Sky Echo. And so our project was done in collaboration with Sky Echo, an early stage startup from Rotterdam. Sky Echo had developed a proprietary new technology to fetch high resolution rainfall data and were developing solutions to monitor and process this data. The focus of their solutions was on urban spaces like cities and we were tasked with conceptualizing various business cases and proof of concepts for them. As such, the objectives of our project were to, firstly, increase weather awareness, and secondly, to increase weather re resilience within cities. And so we came up with several solutions. Through the journey of our project, we prototyped various ideas. We firstly prototyped an embedded hardware device that was able to communicate through Wi-Fi with the rainfall data and trigger certain commands, like the opening and closing of other electrical equipment. For example, in the video you see, you can see us testing out a small-scale tulip that would have served as a shelter from rain. Another prototype we created was a weather clock which would showcase the weather patterns for the next 30 minutes. The use cases would be schools and daycares where children often go out to play, but we also wanted to install it as an art piece to truly understand how users interact with weather information. But our final, most refined prototype was the Planted Game, a geolocation-based game that would help user, make users more aware about rainfall data. For our final prototype, we created a game as it would allow for the ideal environment to help users become acquainted with the complex rainfall data, as well as to provide a concept despite of the restrictions due to COVID-19. Let's take a look at the demo of the game now. Planted is a game that can be best described as a mix of Pokemon Go and Farmville. You start off with a geolocation-based service where you can see where you're located and start by planting your first pot. You have to be within the environment where you would like to plant. There are multiple seeds, all of them which require different amounts of water and sun. As you have planted further, you would be able to check on the status and the health of all your different plants. As we know, more water means the plants are happier. In the future, we expect that the users will also be able to harvest these plants for other rewards within the game and also check on the location of where these plants are located and how differently they're doing based on the rainfall within those environments. Some plants, for example, are doing better than others. You can also manually water some of the plants in case the rainfall hasn't been adequate for these plants themselves. And as you can see, you can harvest these plants for social benefits within the game itself, as well as to compete with your other users. From here, we will take a look at the rain map. This is where the technology that's provided by Sky Echo is provided in an accessible manner to the users. The users are shown high resolution rainfall uh, data from two days in the past and are able to notice how the plants have been interacting with this rainfall data. There are different seeds to collect, which means different rewards to be harvested, and as well as different buckets that can be collected manually so that the user also has other features. And of course, like any other game, there is of course the ability to turn the music on as well as do some other basic configurations. Thank you. Thank you, Apurva. Uh, I'd really like to get that game for a whole lot of children. What a wonderful way to combine gamification to turn a complex topic like weather and climate change into something tangible and accessible for the, uh, for the general public. Lastly, we have Cecilia Bautista Rossell, who has been working on his plant. Cecilia, please introduce yourself and tell us about your project. Cecilia? Thank you, Samanti, and hello, everyone. My name is Cecilia, and I'm studying in Asade. So in Asade, we do not have engineering or design students. So we actually had the chance to collaborate with students from the Polytechnic University of Catalonia and the European Design Institute. In my team, we worked with the, well, 
<laughs> with IBEC, so the Institute of Bioengineering of Catalonia in the His Plant Project. To give you a bit of background about his plant, it wants to improve in vitro fertilization. In in vitro fertilization, you retrieve eggs from a woman and fertilize them outside the womb. On a couple of days, you get around five to 10 embryos and you select one or two to implant back in the woman, normally based on what they look like under the microscope. However, only 30% of these embryos actually implant and get to term. So his plant wants to improve this rate and allow IVF to be more effective by providing embryologists with richer information about the embryos using a non-invasive imaging technology and predictive algorithms and information about the metabolism of the embryo to provide embryologists with possible implantation rates. So in this context, my team and I work with the senior researchers in this project to ideate a way of getting this technology to actually the in vitro fertilization clinics to the market. We were tasked with finding both a way to introduce it into a product that we could take them and also the business model. In the end, after a thorough market research and over like 150 surveys and 56 interviews with professionals worldwide, we decided to integrate the technology into an incubator. Given that like, problems with costs and also with space in the clinics were kind of recurrent among specialists, we decided to ideate an incubator that's stackable and also modular so it can be adapted to the different needs and it only has one imaging device at its core. All in all, it was really a great experience and it really opened my mind to working in areas that are different to those typically chosen by business students. Thank you, Cecilia. I'm sure the audience would like to understand the added value of attract pilot projects. So what better way than to hear it from the engaged students themselves? So I invite Sophia, Akurva, and Cecilia to join me. So let's get started with the first question. The design thinking method of learning is an integral part of the attract projects. It establishes a clear societal need and then identifies potential societal innovations enabled by breakthrough technologies. Sophia, can you please share your most memorable moment that, that enabled this type of learning? Well, for me, it was definitely meeting new people and uh, communication. At the very beginning of the project, our team explored multiple ideas on how the HITC technology could be used but we didn't set on stroke rehabilitation initially. We wanted to explore potentially using technology for medical purposes. To narrow down specific use case and to further develop idea, we needed to come out of our shells and actually talk to people. And in our case, also talk to people that have experienced traumatic and painful events during their lives. When we started user research, it was I was very afraid of talking to people, especially because our ideas were very vague and we didn't even have any prototypes to show yet. But uh, most people that we talked to turned out to be very open and very interested in our project and actually willing to share their experiences. And that made me realize that the main force and the most valuable resource for new product development is other people's experiences. Ah, that's indeed very interesting, Sophia. Thank you. Apurva, would you agree with Sophia? Can you elaborate on how design thinking helped you and your team in Project Sky Echo? Yeah, definitely. I agree completely with what Sophia mentioned. And for us, I think design thinking is also about loving the problem space. It's about empathizing with all the different users and stakeholders, like Sophia mentioned, and about seeing the same problem from different angles. So it's an iterative process. We tried, tested, failed, and developed multiple prototypes just to see how people interact with weather data. And I think that was a big learning about design thinking as well because the idea is to quickly test out different ways of understanding the customer. Because when you're working with technology, we needed to understand how people interact with this, particularly as most of the market was not ready for this technology. So our first step was to familiarize the audience with this technology. And that's why we went with the game idea. And actually one of our biggest insights happened during the development of the game, because when we created the user interface for this game, we designed it so that it was accessible for children, 
But what we identified is that it was also an ideal user interface for adults, because while children need a simple user interface because they are children and don't have the cognitive abilities, we adults tend to use the phone only with one hand. And so by having a simple user interface for children, we were also creating a perfect user interface for adults. And of course, working and collaborating in a multidisciplinary team, we were able to leverage the insights and gather different perspectives on the same problem because we had two designers, two business students, and two engineers as well. Ah, thank you very much, Apurva. That sounds really interesting. It's an environment that allowed you to, uh, it's an environment that allowed you to, uh, uh, to go through failures and to go through successes as well. So that's very interesting. It was rich and a learning environment. Now let's move on to question two. Deep technologies impact almost all major technology areas, such as advanced manufacturing, medical devices, and imaging, life sciences, and biotechnology. Cecilia, how more confident are you with deep tech and innovation because of your participation in his plant? Cecilia. The thing is, like you in his plan, I had the chance to collaborate with design students, engineering students, and also with the research institutions. So you eventually learn how to work effectively with everyone in this context. But for me, the most, like the biggest impact that this attract project had is that it makes you realize that even if you're not from a technical degree, and even if you're not every day embedded in like these deep tech technologies, you can still help them to become to go out to the market and help them to have a societal impact. Like when I started in his plant, I loved the project, but I was kind of afraid that since I didn't understood initially the technology, I would not be able to help them. But the research institute was so approachable and we had a design student in our team actually had a biology background. So everyone got a crash course on in vitro fertilization and on the techniques and on what was going on in the lab. And we were able to get up to speed and to start contributing very, very fast. And what's more, sometimes not knowing about the technology is what made us such a good team because we asked questions the research institute or hadn't considered either because they were just had this idea in mind and they're so used to working with certain technologies that they just, you know, you just it's easier to think outside the box if you're not deeply embedded in a project. So even if I'm not able to create a deep tech project on my own, I learned that it's all about the team and that that shouldn't stop you from trying and from developing technologies and from engaging in it. Thank you. Confidence, Cecilia. That's what I hear from what you've just said. And very well said, Cecilia. Building confidence is an achievement. So I would say that you've taken a huge step forward already. Now, third question. Attract projects bring together businesses, and innovation experts, research infrastructures, funding partners, and students. Apurva, how did this mix of actors in your project, Planted, support an entrepreneurial mindset and skills? Yeah, Apurva. collaborating with various partners allowed us to identify you know, the possible solutions in a wide range of industries. So we had to identify what's the best way to provide the best solution for a particular in industry. So with Planted, the game, we were looking at cities as a service model. So we had to understand how does collaboration with public sector partners, as opposed to you know private sector, truly work in practice. And then of course, we also had the ability to interview a lot of technological experts from different fields. So we interviewed uh, a lot of experts from the engineering companies, the Finnish Meteorological Institute, since we were dealing with weather, and then also future force, uh, foresighting research agencies like CITRA, which is the National Research Institute here in Finland. And we were able to test out different methods as well, like speculative design methods, to test out you know, what are the futures that these different stakeholders see as desirable, undesirable, and what's the best way to provide these futures to them. And then uh, I think personally, because we were able to work with an early stage startup, it also allowed us to truly feel like we were making a contribution to the success of Sky Echo. We were able to discuss as if we were part of the organization themselves, and we were able to leverage our status as students to get really new insights for them. Thank you, Apurva, Cecilia, and Sophia. Don't just go away yet. Let's talk to the experts in the field to get their views, and I invite you three to join in the discussion.
So in our distinguished panel today, we have Lisa Gerkins, Lead Product Strategy at Forward 31 by Porsche Digital, Frank Thielen, Education Director at EIT Inno Energy, and Piotr Palka, Member of the Rector's Team for Innovative Teaching, uh, for Innovative Teaching Methods and Assistant Professor at Warsaw University of Technology. Welcome to our panelists and thank you for joining us. Lisa, I turn first to you. Considering skills gaps and skills mismatches expressed by many employers, what are the benefits in your view that the ATTRACT program offers to make education and training more relevant for the labor market and emerging skills needs of the industry? Lisa. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, for me, there are several aspects to this. So first, the future of the job market is changing and we all need to be more capable to adapt. And I, I believe that we need to educate people to be able to face all kinds of problems. Um, that means the education system needs to give people the toolkit to address that problems. Um, I think to correct that, um, yeah. I mean, um, to know all the problems or the problems aspects right away. That help you to know what, what would your first step be and also how to follow up on that. So that would the start be. And then second, um, I think what's really interested and I think one of the students, I think it was Cecilia said already, um, is it's super important that generalists and experts or future generalists and experts work, learn how to work together and sort of build adapters and really learn how to sort of use the full potential of both sides. Um, I've actually not been part of like um, the attract problem, uh, attract um, uh, project itself, but I've actually been part of one of these uh, Alto projects that is very similar and it's now hosting attract. Um, so I think a full full projects like this really teaches students to own the whole process and understand all the different aspects that go into it. Um, that means like knowing how to start and sort of how to take the next steps, um, working with the budget. Um, and also finding out how to communicate your work. Um, for me, this is, I call this delivery is everything. Um, so I'm not talking about a glossy presentation or somehow doing something very, very um, huge, but um, people can do amazing work, but it will simply lose its impact if they don't know how to deliver it into this society or how to communicate it. So I think that is something super interesting looking at sort of deep tech or fundamental research, um, meeting society. Um, so most of us will not have the opportunity to work in deep tech research or in fundamental research, right? It's just going to be very few. Um, and I think people outside of that might have also issues to understand what it's worth or what is actually being found out there. Um, and giving students the opportunity to work on things like this, um, I think not only gives them sort of extraordinary experiences and an exchange with that, but also gives the research a more embodied platform um, and sort of an access point into society um, to become more measurable for like us, everybody. <laughs> yeah, that, that'd be that. Thank you. Thank you. Apurva, what do you think? What more than deep technologies was necessary for you and your team to create solutions for societal impact? Uh, yeah, so I think one of the most important things was understanding how these technologies need to be introduced uh, to the general audience. Uh, and also understanding you know, the cycles that these technologies take place within the industries. Uh, for example, when we were discussing with Sky Echo, and they were discussing with their stakeholders, which are, which are you know, the Rotterdam city managers or the airports. We understood that this technology is very relevant and very useful, but the industry is not ready for it for the next five years or next 10 years even, depending on who we talk to. So understanding that fact that technology is an iterative process as well was a very insightful thing for our team because 
what we realized is that the general audience simply doesn't know about this technology. And so when we create a game like Planted, we're familiarizing them so that this becomes habitual to them. And also seeing how different users interact with this information and understanding that technology is a means to an end as opposed to just for the sake of it. I think one of the best examples we had was that for the general audience, telling them that there will be 100 millimeters of rain does not give them enough information. It's better to tell them that, okay, maybe instead of taking an umbrella, you should take a raincoat today because an umbrella will blow away in the wind. So we realized that the same technology that's providing this information also has to be translated into the language which the stakeholder understands. Thank you, Purva. Understanding the user, you gave a very good example there. Yes, you, you have to translate what all that data means. So take an umbrella with you and a really sturdy umbrella makes much more sense than uh, 45 millimeters of rain or 100 millimeters of rain. So I really thank you for that answer. Now let's stay with Lisa for the next question. What are the skills, Lisa, that the industry expects students to have? Can these skills be complemented by such programs uh, such as ATTRACT? Um, absolutely, I think so. Um, I, I'd start with the last question. So can they be complemented by such programs? Um, I think this like hands-on uh, university work uh, on exceptional research uh, and real projects is really the way to go in my experience. Of course, it does create sort of like a generalist group, right? Like you might work together with expert, but I'm talking very much about sort of a generalist profile here. Um, so I, I really do believe that um, sort of superior infrastructures make for richer fantasies, meaning that sort of exposing students to fundamental research and to sort of a bigger environment really, and giving them a framework instead of tasks or like something to, to take off, um, really builds sort of essential skills. Um, if we're looking at the job market, um, you, you need to, you're expected to enter the job market with experience in hand. Um, and this is very much something coming from a very theoretic approach. Um, you don't have that experience. So this is like a first step to bridge problems like that. Um, and for instance, in, in my last job, we were growing a team extensively and we've interviewed, I think, between a several hundred people. Um, and, and from that, like, I, I do think I have a view on what, what are the skills that I really looked for right now uh, for like, I think I'm very much talking about like product development roles as Cecilia, Approva and Sophia are talking about. Um, so the industry is really, um, really looking for people that not only know their craft, but also have enough exposure to other topics to not work on these issues detached from their context. Um, meaning you need to be able to set your, your task into a concept. Um, so you need to understand the politics of a project. Uh, you need to be able to work well in different team settings and in different scenarios. Um, you need to be able to build a team and actually be able to harvest all the skills in it. I've seen very big teams when no skills were harvested in the end. <laughs> um, and being to able to change the approach, for instance, from being human-centered or then saying, okay, this time we are technology-centered, what does it change for us? Um, and honestly, in the end, like just knowing, um, being able to adapt to different circumstances and knowing that your project has a budget and working with that. I think that actually sort of is a skill that is super essential. Um, and like maybe one more thing, um, I've had lots of conversation lately with people hiring on sort of all kinds of expertise levels. And if they're not hiring for a super, super, super narrow specific expert role, um, the ability to work in a team and sort of social skills always trumps hard skills, always. So if you're able to work in a multidisciplinary team, if you've proven that, if you've done that, um, it's maybe okay to not tick that one little box out of a big set of things, of hard skills. Um, yeah, that'd be it. 
Thank you. Thank you very much, Lisa. I think you, you hit the nail on the head when you said soft skills are just as important as hard skills. Uh, and I think you really speak from experience. I understand that you uh, came out of university and started your own company. So you speak the speak of companies. So you are the type of person with the expertise needed to bridge this gap between universities and um, companies, business world. So I, I would like uh, to hear more from you uh, later on in the session as well. Now, let's turn to Cecilia. Cecilia, would you like to add anything uh, to what Lisa just said? Yeah, of course. I, I do agree with everything what Lisa just said, and I can say in a track you're given this opportunity and if you do grasp it and try hard and invest yourself in the process you do end up learning how to collaborate with people how to understand the research institution their needs the needs in my case of the embryologist and you do get to practice and to develop those kind of soft skills that in the end as Lisa said are required and I feel in our year we were especially challenged with the adapting to new circumstances and to budgets and to constraints because of COVID. Like in my team, for example, since we were in a health pro healthcare kind of project, COVID really stopped our research and delayed the whole project. And then we just had to adapt to keep going and to keep changing to the, and adapting to new circumstances to finish the project. And it's very rewarding and a very rich experience. Thank you, Cecilia. Um, I understand that uh, Frank uh, Gielen cannot be with us today. Um, it's very, uh, he's there. Oh, okay, I just I uh, yeah, I understand that he's here. Welcome, Frank. Thank you. Can you hear me, Frank? Yes, I can hear you. Fine, that's fine. Uh, okay, welcome, welcome to our session, Frank. You are the education director at EIT Inno Energy. Could you please share? Uh, tell us a little bit about your initiative and how it addresses entrepreneurship education and innovation skills. Okay, so um, EIT is, is um, making entrepreneurship and innovation training as part of regular master and PhD programs of our partner universities. And um, the way we are doing this is really by um, developing the skills in a way that it's hand, very hands-on. So each of the programs which we work in we look at, well, what does it mean to be entrepreneurial? Because sometimes people nail this down or, or limit this to making a startup in a garage, which it is not. And so what we have clearly set in Inno Energy and also in EIT, entrepreneurship really means, well, the ability to use your skills under circumstances that are changing very quickly. And that can be innovation, that can be entrepreneurship, but that's also COVID. So we are looking at... Um, training those skills in those circumstances. And specifically, um, we have focused on very active learning. So learning by doing, by introducing, first of all, challenges from companies. So learning from the real world and connecting our, our students to the other partners in our ecosystem, being the startups and the companies. And this is the mix that we put in the, in the, um, in the program. So it's not just teaching but it's really hands-on learning together with other startups, together with other companies, and making sure that this is part of the pedagogy and the curriculum. Thank you, Frank. So you've just brought home the message that Lisa was, uh, say, was advocating. It's a real-life example. You push your students through real-world examples. Yes. So your initiative is indeed groundbreaking. So hold the thought, Frank. I'll come back to you in a few minutes. I'd like now to go to Piotr. Piotr, you are based at Warsaw University of Technology and you are a member of the team for innovative teaching methods. In your view, Piotr, compared to universities of technology, are the more traditional universities adapting or resisting to new modes of learning and teaching? And why do you think? Piotr. So, uh... There are methods, in general, there are methods of education that was established over the years and the, that are copied. Uh, on the other way, there are uh, some experiments in education that explores the field. Uh, so that, that's uh, two sides of, of the matter. 
Uh, in general, the uh, higher education institution's goal is to educate, educate specialist experts in a given field. Uh, and uh, we, of course, have a support uh, uh, in the national uh, competency framework, uh, European competency frameworks, and that framework gives us help with the curricula uh, upbringing. Uh, this framework contains recommendations, and the recommendations are aimed at introducing new education models, uh, although they might be understood differently. Um, the authorities of Polish universities uh, in last year, over the last years, are rather in favor of introducing new education models. Uh, on the example of Warsaw University of Technology, I can see a huge evolution over the time. Six years ago, there were almost no problem-based learning or design thinking-based courses. At this moment, there are more than 20 of them across our university. Uh, in a few days, uh, we are launching a new Internet of Things engineering program, and it is wholly based on problem-based learning methods and double diamond. Uh, however, uh, so this is uh, cherry on the top of the cake. Uh, however, we should be aware of the fact that the process of transforming the education may be slow, and it, it is slow. And uh, it's caused by the fact that the education is created by people. Uh, and is it, is it often difficult to change the mindset, the approaches of, uh, of the people that educate and method in the moment? Uh, so it is rather evolutionary process, not revolutionary for one. Thank you, Piotr. Frank, coming back to you, I'm certain that EIT Inno Energy cooperates with a lot of higher education institutions. What is your experience? Is there resistance, do you think, or is adaptation underway? To, uh, and are they adapting to new modes of learning? Frank? Yes, well, I think as with any innovation change program, I mean, you have early adopters and you have late adopters. And we see that also in EIT because, I mean, introducing new learning methods uh, and that I'm speaking about really not just doing the teaching anymore, but using active learning, problem-based learning, challenge-driven learning, uh, working in an ecosystem where the stakeholders, not only the professor, but also some industry people, that requires a lot of changes and it requires changes from the teaching staff, the faculty staff, from the university management, also from the students. And it just takes a long time. And usually, I mean, I would say it's almost the standard cookbook of innovation. We always start with the early adopters. We find the, the ambassadors, the people that are really pushing this in their institute and we are trying to help them, support them and expand. So yes, I mean, there is resistance, but there is always resistance when there is change. It's our role to make sure that uh, we can show the value of the change, because what we have learned is that once people see the value, then they say, wow, this is really working better. It's a different way of working, but it's more effective. It has more impact. And we, don't, we, we should not forget that we are entering a very competitive stage with education. And, and uh, if we are not adapting, somebody else will take some part of that role. And some of you may have seen the announcement from Google that they are now um, accepting people that follow their trainings at par with a master degree. So, and Google is usually the first to do such things and you can expect other ones to follow. So, but uh, I, I do believe that um, education leaders and universities are willing to change, but it's a, it's a big boat. And when you have to turn it, you have to be patient and work with all the stakeholders. And for me, that's important. If you leave out anybody, there will be the resistance. And sometimes it's a student, sometimes it's the chancellor of the university, sometimes it's a professor, but you need to see the full picture. Thank you. Thank you very much, Frank. Uh, you really put it very well. Uh, your experience shows through. I, I'm sure that we there is hope. Uh, the EIT is a good example. Uh, Piotr is a good example. So we'll get there. And your message is well received and very clear. Piotr, coming back to you now, what more do you think uh, may be done at EU level to promote learning and teaching similar to what is being offered uh, in the ATTRACT projects and in EIT? 
So, uh, first, I agree with Frank. Uh, <laughs> uh, you are right uh, in what you said. But uh, backing to the question of Sumati, so, as, we all, as all, we, uh, all of us know, uh, the European Commission run programs, different programs. And uh, the universities and institutions uh, participate in that program. Uh, I just participated in uh, Universities of the Future project, uh, where the main assumption was co-creation and joint work of international teams of students. Uh, also, about a year ago, I worked on the Erasmus Plus application that was called European Universities, where one of the tasks of which Warsaw University of Technology uh, is the head is so social-centered education. And the goal there is to gather the society around the university in co-creation of the projects and solving the problems, real problems that society has. So uh, I think that's the, uh, that's the good uh, direction where the universities uh, and institutions can go of course, with support of European Union or European Commission. Um, so, in my opinion, what the EU can do is to support such initiatives and uh, to create a friendly framework uh, for development, testing the projects that support innovation in learning. Uh, one of significant uh, organizations uh, is Design Factory Global Network. And uh, this uh, organization creates the condition for different universities from all around the world to cooperate on the different projects, uh, multidisciplinary projects, uh, innovative ones, and uh, our university as well as different, all uh, the other universities participated in that and uh, attract is one of the projects, I think. So uh, the goal of the uh, European Union is to change the mindset of uh, high administration, authorities, and teachers. Thank you, Piotr. Now, uh, we've just heard from management level at the university. Let's turn to the student. Apurva, can you share the student's perspective on this? Yeah, yeah. So definitely, I agree with what uh, Piotr mentioned. But I think what Attract really did well was give the students the independence and the access that we really need. Uh, because as students, we want to be empowered. We don't necessarily always want to be told this is how you do it. And this was a radically different approach because we were presented with technologies and we were presented with these startups. But how we chose to approach the problem was left to us with the right kind of facilitation. Uh, but I think the other thing that Attract was able to do was further bridge this gap between the students and the market. Like uh, generally we feel that first we do university and then we go to the job market. But here that was transitioning really well because we were working straight up with the startups, seeing how they work and what are the problems that they actually face. Because these were such early stage startups, we saw the real problems of you know, the business world, which were sometimes not shown if we're working as students. Uh, but I think uh, the general trend, and also this is interesting because I'm doing my master's thesis on this, is that students want to be able to truly make an impact, a societal impact. And as opposed to simply you know, creating a pitch or a presentation, here we actually got to work on a societal level challenge with a startup and with research coming from these organizations like CERN. And of course, what it also meant was we were able to showcase these results to the right channels, like this uh, conference today. And lastly, I think this is something I feel proud to be a student of Alta is because we felt like Alta University shows a lot of trust to the students. And as students, we want to be trusted. So I think this is very prevalent within the Design Factory Global Network, but this could also be uniform across all the universities in the EU, for example. Thank you, Apurva. Message received well, loud and clear. You want the room, you want the space, you want to experiment, you want experiential learning. Thank you. Thank you, distinguished panelists, and thank you, Apurva, Cecilia, and Sophia. It's time now for questions from the audience. I think we do have enough time for two questions. So let's take a first one. And it's uh, for Sophia. Sophia, um, the question is, 
the question is from Anj. Hello, I'm a master student, theoretical particle physics from the University of Warsaw. I want to ask you how to be part of the ATTRACT project. Sophia, can you answer that, please? Thank you. Well, the way how I became part of this project was um, just being open to the possibilities uh, that my university's design factory provided. Um, well, yeah, I just came across this opportunity to become a part of the PDP global team in the PDP project in Alto. Well, yeah. <laughs> Um, if you're if you're in Warsaw, then I guess uh, you have to see what uh, the design factory in Warsaw does, <laughs> and just um, yeah, keep an eye on the design factory global network. It's a very nice community. Thank you, thank you, Cecilia. Let's take a second question. I put Lisa on hold, so I'm coming back to Lisa now. Lisa, what's the added value for industry in working with students? Uh, on these kinds of projects? Uh, it's, I think, an anonymous question, but I'm sure you could take it. Yeah. Um, well, that, that's, that's a good question. Uh, I think um, it, different companies do due to different reasons, right? Um, for some, it's, it's uh, just a hosting thing where they say, like, we sponsor projects all around and we find that interesting. I think, in general, it's really... Um, Mainly, it's a really, really good way to look at talent. Um, you have, in some of these projects, you have up to like nine months time to actually see people working on a topic. And even if you only meet them a couple of times in between, um, you'll still have a better view on, on a group of people than after, after an interview. And then that's sort of the one side. And then the other side is, I don't see um, a, a, a big difference towards the outcome. Like, the diff like, what if you have like a freshly hired person working on something versus a last uh, year student? Um, the difference is probably not big, except for that maybe the university student, due to the program uh, and due to the framework, doesn't have as much pressure to sort of uh, uh, make the, the, the company happy uh, with the result. Um, but for that matter, I think it's simply sort of explore new things. Uh, it's very interesting to see like what students end up with, what do they find interesting, actually the results and talent, I would say. Uh, that, that would sort of be the thing that are really interesting uh, and be part of that community as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lisa. Now, um, yeah, we do have time for one more question. Um, I'll direct this to Cecilia. Cecilia, what kind of classes did you have at university to train you for these types of projects? Cecilia? Yeah, so I actually studied at Rotterdam School of Management. I did my bachelor's there, and both RSM and SADE do have a lot of these kind of project-based classes. Like on my first year of bachelor, we were required, for example, to find a company and to do a business plan for, for them. But students were required to find a company and most of us were international. So we were challenged to go out there and convincing people to collaborate with us. So that communication is there. Other projects are more like technical, like, I don't know, learning how to code, for example, in my master and artificial intelligence that allow you to understand these technologies and to make it easier. I also had technology management, which was a similar project, also collaborating with other technical students. I think it's all a mix of theoretical and practical courses, and there's some key courses that, for me, it was those three that allowed me to thrive in this kind of project. Yes. So you're hitting home the message again. It's hard skills and soft skills as well. It's the combination. Okay. Uh, very good questions. Um, I think uh, we do have time for one more. And this question is, what should universities provide the students with to succeed in these projects? And this goes to Frank. Frank? Well, I think that, um, first of all, it's, uh, 
training their own staff in those new pedagogical methods because uh, lecturing is different than uh, coaching a, um, a project where students work on and um, that's for me one of the the key things to do but also the um, i think the university should be um, helping in making sure that uh, the project work is reaching the uh, academic levels that you would expect in terms of the outcomes and because in the end of the day you need to acquire some skills and competences and, and those to be validated but um, like i said in the beginning with the change program uh, introducing project-based learning is a big change for the for the teaching staff and we should uh, make sure that they are trained in this okay thank you frank um, yes, teachers, uh, facilitators, mentors, guides, you said it well. Uh, the role of the teacher is changing, so we need to take this. They need to be able to bridge um, companies with, with uh, universities and with students. So it's a new kind of language, a new bridge that we need to build. So uh, let's wrap up this session. We have a few minutes left. Um, I'll try and conclude. Europe is not fully succeeding uh, in educating innovators and young entrepreneurs. But tomorrow's innovation starts with today's education. And so the, the role of the university is key in this. Higher education institutions need to do more to incorporate the innovation culture in the curriculum, as we heard today. This challenge cannot be solved alone. We need to cooperate. Initiatives like ATTRACT are the basis of this uh, cooperation. They establish uh, bridges between different actors and provide opportunities for young innovators leveraging on design thinking, uh, which is a new mode of learning for social innovation. Now, taking the, uh, we've taken the first steps for a hands-on introduction of this highly needed innovation culture uh, to, tradition, uh, to the traditionally academic environment and practices. But we need to scale up these initiatives like ATTRACT so opportunities for young innovators materialize and we are recognized at a pan-European level. We heard from the students. They all love it. They experience it. They want more of it. So students, academics, researchers and university staff who are engaged in, in initiatives such as ATTRACT must be rewarded. They must be trained. They must be offered continuous professional development and they must be it must be reflected in their career progression. They must have incentives and they must be rewarded. It's clear that collaboration and engagement between higher education institutions and innovation actors must be brought together to, a next, to the next level. The European Universities Initiative aims at bringing about such structural, systemic and sustainable change. This is a new initiative which will bring together higher education institutions, research institutions or organizations, non-academic partners, cities, regions, students, innovation spaces, and so on. Erasmus and Horizon 2020 funds and national investment all come together to be combined to achieve education, research, innovation, and service to society missions of European universities. We look forward to the transformation of universities through the European universities all across Europe. With this, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to thank our distinguished panel and our very enterprising and innovative students. Thank you also to the organizers, Romain Muller, Vanessa Costanza, Shreya Sikar, Marty Yepke, and the technical professionals. Our appreciation also goes out to the audience for their participation, for their interesting questions. We hope that this has been a fruitful session. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you to Mati and thank you to all the panelists. I think it was one of the most challenging panel. You had a lot of people on the panel, a lot of material to share, a lot of enthusiasm, energy, and I think it really went through the screen. So this was uh, really enjoyable to watch. I think Europe can be proud of its students and especially the students coming from the Attract project. I think they are also kind of uh, showing the way and based on the question that you also kindly shared on the slide window, um, we could really sense this kind of uh, momentum building and it's really good to see that there are initiatives that uh, go in this direction of empowering students to, to, to go into more un un uncharted territories and, and discover themselves and, and discover how they can also contribute to society. So how can Deep Tech contribute to social innovation? 
thanks again for casting light on uh, what Europe can do to best and better train its uh, young generation for the future.